Podcastle, episode 785, for Tuesday the 2nd of May 2023. Biographical note to A Discourse on the Nature of Causality with Airplanes by Benjamin Rosenbaum. By Benjamin Rosenbaum. Read by Graham Dunlop and rated PG. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Podcastle, the flying castle of fantasy fiction. I'm your host, Matt Dovey, and it's my honour to present for your enjoyment another 15th anniversary special episode with a tale from the vault selected by an editor emeritus. Today I am delighted to give you biographical notes to A Discourse on the Nature of Causality with Airplanes by Benjamin Rosenbaum, by Benjamin Rosenbaum, narrated by Graham Dunlop. This episode originally ran as episode 90 back in February 2010 and was selected for us today by Anne Leckie, one of our founding editors. And remember to hang around at the end of the episode for a friendly interview with Anne, where we'll chat about the early days of Podcastle, how fantasy and science fiction are basically the same thing, and what she's up to now. Benjamin Rosenbaum's stories have been nominated for the Hugo, Nebula, BSFA, Sturgeon and World Fantasy Awards translated into 25 languages and adapted as a South by Southwest Best Animated Short and a Sick Flick Chicks Best Sci-Fi Film. He lives near Basel, Switzerland. His first novel, The Unraveling, is a far future comedy of manners and social unrest, a tale of family, hard choices and growing up that wildly challenges understanding of gender, class, family, the body and moral agency in a complicated world, and came out from Era One Books in 2021. Graham Dunlop has been involved with the Skate Passes for many years, producing audio, hosting shows, narrating stories and keeping the websites going. He was born in Australia, although people have identified him as English, American and South African amongst other nationalities. He loves the spoken word. Graham lives in Melbourne, Australia, with his wife Amanda and beautiful boy dog Jake. And now pay attention, for our tale is about to begin, and the details will be important for resolving whether you are the tale or the teller. Biographical Notes to A Discourse on the Nature of Causality with Airplanes by Benjamin Rosenbaum by Benjamin Rosenbaum On my return from Plaus Fab, Wisconsin, a delightful festival of art and inquiry which styles itself the world's only gynarchist plausible fable assembly. Aboard the PRGB Sri George Bernard Shaw, I happened to share a compartment with Prem Ramasan, Raja of Altamos Thule, and his consort, a dour but beautiful woman whose name I did not know. Two great blonde barbarians bearing the livery of Altamos Thule an elephant astride an iceberg and a volcano, stood in the hallway outside, armed with sabres and needle throwers. Politely they asked me if they might frisk me, then allowed me in. They ignored the short dagger at my belt, presumably accounting their leisure's skill at arms more than sufficient to equal mine. I took my place on the embroidered divan. Good evening, I said. The Raja flashed me a white-toothed smile and inclined his head. His consort pulled a wisp of blue veil across her lips and looked out the porthole. I took my notebook, pen and inkwell from my valise, set the inkwell into the port provided in the white pine table set in the wall, and slid aside the strings that bound the notebook. The inkwell lit with a faint blue glow. The Raja was shuffling through a wisdom deck, pausing to look at the incandescent faces of the cards, then up at me. You are the plausible fabulist Benjamin Rosenbaum, he said at length. I bowed stiffly. A pen name, of course, I said. Taken from the Scarlet Pimpernel, he asked, cocking one eyebrow curiously. My lord is very quick, I said mildly. The Raja laughed, indicating the wisdom deck with a wave. (laughs) He isn't the most heroic or sympathetic character in that book, however. 
Indeed not, my lord, I said with polite restraint. The name is chosen ironically, as a sort of challenge to myself, if you will. Bearing the name of a notorious anti-Hebraic caricature, I must needs be all the prouder and more subtle in my own literary endeavours. Hmm, you're a Karaite then? he asked. I am an Israelite at any rate, I said, if not an orthodox follower of my people's traditional religion of despair. The prince's eyes glittered with interest, so, despite my reservations, I explained my researches into the rabbinical heresy which had briefly flourished in Palestine and Babylon at the time of Ashoka and its lost Talmud. Fascinating, said the Raja. Do you return now to your family? I am altogether without attachments, my liege, I said, my face darkening with shame. Excusing myself, I delved once again into my writing, pausing now and then to let my wisdom ants scurry from the inkwell to taste the ink with their antennae, committing it to memory for later editing. At Plausfab, Wisconsin, I'd received an assignment to construct a plausible fable of a world without zeppelins, and I was trying to imagine some alternative air conveyance for my characters when the prince spoke again. I am an enthusiast for plausible fables myself, he said. I enjoyed your droplet greatly. Thank you, your highness. Are you writing such a grand extrapolation now? I'm trying my hand at a shadow history, I said. The prince laughed gleefully. His consort had nestled herself against the bulkhead and fallen asleep, the blue gauze of her veil obscuring her features. I adore shadow history, he said. Most shadow history proceeds with the logic of dream, full of odd echoes and distorted resonances of our world, I said. I'm experimenting with a new form in which a single point of divergence in history leads to a new causal chain of events, and thus a different present. But the world is a dream, he said excitedly. Your idea smacks of democratan materialism, as if the events of the world were produced purely by linear cause and effect, the simplest of the five forms of causality. Indeed, I said. How fanciful, he cried. I was about to turn again to my work, but the prince clapped his hands thrice. From his baggage, a bird-like wisdom servant unfolded itself and stepped agilely onto the floor. Fully unfolded, it was three cubits tall, with a trapezoidal head and incandescent blue eyes. It took a silver tea service from an alcove in the wall, set the tray on the table between us, and began to pour. Wake up, Sarasvati Sutas Dottir, the prince said to his consort, stroking her shoulder. We are celebrating. The servitor placed a steaming cup before me. I capped my pen and shooed my ants back into their inkwell, though one crawled stubbornly towards the tea. What are we celebrating? I asked. You shall come with me to Aldemos Thule, he said. It is a magical place, all fire and ice, except where it's greensward and sheep. <laughs> Home once of epic heroes, Rama's cousins. His consort took a sleepy sip of her tea. I have need of a plausible fabulist. You can write the history of the Thule that might have been to inspire and quell my restive subjects. Why me, your highness? I'm hardly a fabulist of great renown. Perhaps I could help you contact someone more suitable. Karen Despair Robinson, say, or Howie Kumar Fukota. Nonsense, laughed the Raja, for I've met none of them by chance in an airship compartment. But yet, I said discomforted, ha, you speak again like a materialist. This is why the East, once it was awakened, was able to conquer the West. We understand how to read the dream that the world is. Come, no more fuss. I lifted my teacup. The stray wisdom ant was crawling along its rim. I positioned my forefinger before her that she might climb onto it. 
Just then, there was a scuffle at the door, and Prem Ramazan set his teacup down and rose. He said something admonitory in the harsh Nordic tongue of his adopted country, something I imagined to mean, Come now, boys, let the conductor through. The scuffle ceased, and the Raja slid the door of the compartment open, one hand on the hilt of his sword. There was the sharp hiss of a needle thrower, and he staggered backward, collapsing into the arms of his consort, who cried out. The thin and angular wisdom servant plucked the dart from its master's neck. Poison, it said, its voice a tangle of flute-like harmonics. The assassin will possess its antidote. Sarasvati, Siddha's dot here, began to scream. It is true that I had not accepted Prem Ramasan's offer of employment. Indeed, that he had not seemed to find it necessary to actually ask. It is true also that I am a man of letters, neither spy nor bodyguard. It is furthermore true that I was unarmed, save for the ceremonial dagger at my belt, which had thus far seen employment only in the slicing of bread, cheese and tomatoes. Thus, the fact that I leapt through the doorway over the fallen bodies of the prince's bodyguard and pursued the fleeing form of the assassin down the long and curving corridor cannot be reckoned as a habitual or forthright action. Nor, in truth, was it a considered one. In Sri Grigory Guptanovich Karthaganov's typology of action and motive, it must be accounted an impulsive, transformative action, the unreflective moment which changes forever the path of events. Causes buzz around any such moment like bees around a hive, returning with pollen and information, exiting with hunger and ambition. The assassin's strike was the proximate cause. The prince's kind manner, his enthusiasm for plausible fables, and my work in particular, his apparent sympathy for my people, the dark eyes of his consort, all these were inciting causes. The psychological cause, surely, can be found in this name that I have chosen, Benjamin Rosenbaum, the fat and cowardly merchant of the Scarlet Pimpernel, who is beaten and raises no hand to defend himself, just as we, deprived of our temple, found refuge in endless, beautiful elegies of despair, turning our backs on the rabbis and their dreams of a new beginning. I've always seethed against this passivity. Perhaps then I was waiting, my whole life, for such a chance at rash and violent action. The figure, clothed head to toe in a dull grey that matched the airship's hull, raced ahead of me down the deserted corridor and descended through a maintenance hatch set in the floor. I reached it and paused for breath, thankful my enthusiasm for the favourite sport of my continent, the exalted La Crosse, had prepared me somewhat for the chase. I did not imagine, though, that I could overpower an armed and trained assassin, Yet the weave of the world had brought me here, surely to some purpose. How could I do aught but follow? Beyond the proximate, inciting, and psychological causes, there are the more fundamental causes of an action. These address how the action embeds itself into the weave of the world like a nettle in cloth. They rely on cosmology and epistemology. If the world is a dream... What caused the dreamer to dream that I chased the assassin? If the world is a lesson, what should this action teach? If the world is a gift, a wild and mindless rush of beauty riven of logical purpose, as it sometimes seems, still, seen from above, it must possess its own aesthetic harmony. The spectacle, then, of a ludicrously named practitioner of a half-despised art bastard child of literature and philosophy, clumsily attempting the role of hero on the middle deck of the PRGB Sri George Bernard Shaw, must surely have some part in the pattern, chord or discord, tragic or comic. Hesitantly, I poked my head down through the hatch. Beneath, a spiral staircase descended through a workroom cluttered with tools, I could hear the faint hum of engines nearby. There, in the canvas of the outer hull, between the shore's great aluminium ribs, 
a door to the sky was open. From a workbench, I took and donned an airman's vest, supple leather gloves and a visored mask to shield me somewhat from the assassin's needle. I leaned my head out of the door. A brisk wind whipped across the skin of the ship. I took a tether from a nearby anchor and hooked it to my vest. The assassin was untethered. He crawled along a line of handholds and footholds set in the airship's gently curving surface. Many cubits beyond him, a small and brightly coloured glider clung to the shore, like a dragonfly splayed upon a watermelon. It was the first time I'd seen a glider put to any utilitarian purpose, espionage rather than sport, and immediately I was seized by the longing to return to my notebook. Gliders! In a world without dirigibles, my heroes could travel in some kind of immense, powered gliders! Of course, they would be forced to land whenever winds were unfavourable. Or would they? I recalled that my purpose was not to repaint our world anew, but to speculate rigorously according to Democritan logic. Each new cause could lead to some wholly new effect, causing in turn some unimagined consequence. Given different economic incentives then, and with no overriding higher pattern to dictate the results, well, who knew what advances a glider-based science of aeronautics might achieve? Exhilarating speculation! I glanced down, and the sight below wrenched me from my reverie. The immense panoply of the Great Lakes. Their dark green, wave-wrinkled water. The paler green and tawny yellow fingers of land reaching in among them. Puffs of cloud gambling in the bulk of air between. And beyond, the vault of sky presiding over the Frankish and Athapascan moiety. It was a long way down. Malkat Hashemayim, I murmured aloud. What am I doing? I was wondering that myself, said a high and glittering timbrel of chords and discords by my ear. It was the recalcitrant tea-seeking wisdom ant, now perched on my shoulder. Well, I said crossly, do you have any suggestions? My sisters have tasted the neurotoxin coursing through the prince's blood, the ant said. We do not recognize it. His servant has kept him alive so far, but an antidote is beyond us. She gestured towards the fleeing villain with one delicate antenna. The assassin will likely carry an antidote to his venom. If you can place me on his body, I can find it. I will then transmit the recipe to my sisters through the Brahmanic field. Perhaps they can formulate a close analogue in our inkwell. It is a chance, I agreed, but the assassin is halfway to his craft. True, said the ant pensively. I have an idea for getting there, I said, but you will have to do the math. The tether which bound me to the shore was fastened high above us. I crawled upwards and away from the glider to a point the ant calculated. The handhold ceased, but I improvised with the letters of the airship's name, raised in decoration from its side. From the top of an R, I leapt into the air, struck with my heels against the resilient canvas, and rebounded, sailing outwards, snapping the tether taut. The ant took shelter in my collar as the air roared around us. We described a long arc, swinging past the surprised assassin to the brightly coloured glider. I was able to seize its aluminium frame. I hooked my feet onto its seat and hung there, my heart racing. The glider creaked, but held. Disembark, I panted to the ant. When the assassin gains the craft, you can search him. Her, said the ant, crawling down my shoulder. She has removed her mask, and in our passing I was able to observe her striking resemblance to Sarasvati Siddhastotir, the prince's consort. She is clearly her sister. I glanced at the assassin. Her long black hair now whipped in the wind. She was braced against the airship's hull with one hand and one foot. With the other hand, she had drawn her needle thrower. That is interesting information, I said, as the ant crawled off my hand and onto the glider. Good luck. Goodbye, said the ant. A needle whizzed by my cheek. 
I released the glider and swung once more into the cerulean sphere. Once again I passed the killer, covering my face with my leather gloves. A dart glanced off my visor. Once again I swung beyond the door to the maintenance room and towards the hull. Predictably, however, my momentum was insufficient to attain it. I described a few more dizzying swings of decreasing arc length until I hung, nauseous, terrified, and gently swaying at the end of the tether amidst the sky. To discourage further needles, I protected the back of my head with my arms and faced downwards. That's when I noticed the pirate ship. It was sleek and narrow and black, designed for manoeuvrability. Like the shore, it had a battery of sails for fair winds and propellers in an aft assemblage, but the shore travelled in a predictable course and carried a fixed set of coiled tensors whose millions of microsprings gradually relaxed to produce its motive force. The new craft spouted clouds of white steam, carrying its own generatory. It could rewind its tensile batteries while underway. And, unlike the shore, it was armed. A cruel array of arbalest harpoons was mounted at either side. It carried its sails below, sporting at its top two razor-sharp saw ridges with which it could gut recalcitrant prey. All this would have been enough to recognise the craft as a pirate, but it displayed the universal device of pirates as well, that parody of the yin-yang, all yang, declaring allegiance to imbalance. In a yellow circle, two round black dots stared like unblinking demonic eyes. Beneath, a black semicircle leered with empty, ravenous bonhomie. I dared a glance upward in time to see the glider launch from the shore's side. Whoever the mysterious assassin sister was, whatever her purpose, political symbolism, personal revenge, dynastic ambition, anarchic mania, she was a fantastic glider pilot. She gained the air with a single supple backflip, twirled the glider once, then hung deftly in the sky considering. Most people surely would have wondered at the meaning of a pirate and an assassin showing up together. What resonance, what symbolism, what hortatory or aesthetic purpose did the world intend thereby? But my mind was still with my thought experiment. Imagine there are no causes but mechanical ones, that the world is nothing but a chain of dominoes. Every plausible fabulous spends long hours teasing apart fictional plots, imagining consequences, conjuring and discarding the antecedents of desired events. We dirty our hands daily with the simplest and grubbiest of the five forms. Now I tried to reason thus about life. Were the pirate and the assassin in league? It seemed unlikely. If the assassin intended to trigger political upheaval and turmoil, pirates surely spoiled the attempt. A death at the hands of pirates while travelling in a foreign land is not the stuff of which revolutions are made. If the intent was merely to kill Ramesson, surely one or the other would suffice. Yet was I to credit chance then with the intrusion of two violent enemies in the same hour into my hitherto tranquil existence? Absurd. Yet the idea had an odd attractiveness. If the world was a blind machine, surely such clumsy coincidences would be common. The assassin saw the pirate ship, yet with an admirable consistency she seemed resolved to finish what she had started. She came for me. I drew my dagger from its sheath. Perhaps at first I had some wild idea of throwing it, or parrying her needles, though I had the skill for neither. She advanced to a point some fifteen cubits away. From there, her spring-fired darts had more than enough power to pierce my clothing. I could see her face now, a choleric, wild-eyed homunculus of her phlegmatic sisters. The smooth black canvas of the pirate ship was now thirty cubits below me. The assassin banked her glider's wings against the wind, hanging like a kite. 
She let go its aluminium frame with her right hand and drew her needle thrower. Summoning all my strength, I struck the tether that held me with my dagger's blade. My strength, as it happened, was extremely insufficient. The tether twanged like a harp string, but was otherwise unharmed, and the dagger was knocked from my grasp by the recoil. The assassin burst out laughing and covered her eyes. Feeling foolish, I seized the tether in one hand and unhooked it from my vest with the other. Then I let go. Since that time, I have on various occasions enumerated to myself, with a mixture of wonder and chagrin, the various ways I might have died. I might have snapped my neck, or landing on my stomach, folded into a V and broken my spine like a twig. If I had struck one of the craft's aluminium ribs, I should certainly have shattered bones. What is chance? Is it best to liken it to the whim of some being of another scale or scope, the dreamer of our dream? Or to regard the world as having an inherent pattern, mirroring itself at every stage and scale? Or could our world arise, as Democritus held, willy-nilly of the couplings and patternings of endless dumb particulates? While hanging from the shore, I had decided that the protagonist of my Democritan shadow history, should I live to write it, would be a man of letters, a dabbler in philosophy like myself, who lived in an advanced society committed to philosophical materialism. I relished the apparent paradox. An intelligent man in a sophisticated nation forced to account for all events purely within the rubric of overt mechanical causation. Yet those who today complacently regard the materialist hypothesis as dead, pointing to the Brahmanic field and its wisdom creatures, to the predictive successes, from weather to history, of the theory of five causal forms, forget that the question is, at bottom, axiomatic. The materialist hypothesis, the primacy of matter over mind, is undisprovable. What successes might some other science in another history have built upon its bulwark? So, I cannot say, I cannot say, if it is meaningful or meaningless, the fact that I struck the pirate vessel's resilient canvas with my legs and buttocks was flung upwards again to bounce and roll until I fetched up against the wall of the airship's dorsal razor weapon. I cannot say, if some preserver spared my life through will, if some pattern needed me for the skein it wove, or if a patternless and unforetellable chance spared me all unknowing. There was a small closed hatchway in the razor spine nearby, whose overhanging ridge provided some protection against my adversary. Bruised and weary, groping incohately among theories of chance and purpose, I scrambled for it as the boarding gongs and klaxons began. The shore knew it could neither outrun nor outfight the swift and dangerous corsair. It idled above me, awaiting rapine. The brigands' longboats launched, lean and manoeuvrable black dirigibles the size of killer whales, with parties of armed sky bandits clinging to their sides. The glider turned and dove, a blur of gold and crimson and verdant blue disappearing over the pirate zeppelin's side, abandoning our duel, I imagined, for some redoubt many leagues below. Oddly, I was sad to see her go. True, I'd known her only from wanton violence. She had almost killed me. I crouched, battered, terrified and nauseous on the summit of a pirate corsair on her account, and the kind Raja, my almost employer, might be dead. Yet I felt our relations had reached as yet no satisfactory conclusion. It is said that we fabulists live two lives at once. First we live as others do, 
seeking to feed and clothe ourselves, earn the respect and affection of our fellows, fly from danger, entertain and satiate ourselves on the things of this world. But then, too, we live a second life, pawing through the moments of the first, even as they happen, like a market woman of the bazaar, sifting trash for treasures. Every agony we endure, we also hold up to the light with great excitement, expecting it will be of use. Every simple joy we regard with a critical eye, wondering how it could be changed, honed, tightened to fit inside a fable's walls. The hatch was locked. I removed my mask and visor and lay on the canvas basking in the afternoon sun, hoping my aunts had met success in their apothecary and saved the prince. Watching the pirate longboat sack the unresisting PRGB-3 George Bernard Shaw and return laden with valuables and, perhaps, hostages. I was beginning to wonder if they would ever notice me, if perhaps I should signal them, when the cacophony of gongs and klaxons resumed, louder, insistent, angry, and the longboats raced back down to anchor beneath the pirate ship. Curious, I found a ladder set in the Razor Ridge's metal wall that led to a lookout platform. A war city was emerging from a cloud bank some leagues away. I had never seen any work of man so vast. Fully twelve great dirigible hulls, each dwarfing the shore, were bound together in a constellation of outbuildings and propeller assemblies. Near the centre, a great plume of white steam rose from a pillar, a heart of the sun reactor where the dull yellow ore called Yama's flesh is driven to realise an enlightenment through the ministrations of Wisdom Sadhus. There was a spyglass set in the railing by my side. I peered through, scanning the features of this new apparition. None of the squabbling statelets of my continent could muster such a vessel, certainly, and only the powers, Cathay, Gabon, the Aryan Raj, could afford to fly one so far afield though the Khmer and Malay might have the capacity to build them. There's little enough to choose between the meddling powers, though Gabon makes the most pretense of investing in its colonies and believing in its supposed civilising mission. This craft, though, was clearly Hindu. Every cubit of its surface was bedecked with a facade of cytoceramic statuary, Couples coupling in five thousand erotic poses, thermomorphic gods gesturing to soothe or menace, Rama in his chariot, heroes riddled with arrows and fighting on, saints undergoing martyrdom. In one corner I spotted the Israelite avatar of Vishnu hanging on his cross between Shiva and Ganesh. Then I felt rough hands on my shoulders. Five pirates had emerged from the hatch, cutlasses drawn. Their dress was motley and ragged, their features varied, Sikh, Chosan, Baltic, Frankish, and Aztec, I surmised. None of us spoke as they led me through the rat's maze of catwalks and ladders set between the ship's inner and outer hulls. I was queasy and light-headed with bruises, hunger, and the aftermath of rash and strenuous action. It seemed odd indeed that the day before I'd been celebrating and debating with the plausible fabulists gathered at Wisconsin. I recalled that there had been a fancy dress ball there with a pirate theme, and the images of yesterday's festive, well-groomed pirates of fancy interleaved with those of today's grim and unwashed captors on the long climb down to the bridge. The bridge was in the gondola that hung beneath the pirate airship's bulk, forwards of the rigging. It was crowded with lean and dangerous men in pantaloons, sarongs and leather trousers. They consulted paper charts and the liquid glowing forms swimming in wisdom tanks, spoke through bronze tubes set in the walls, 
barked orders to cabin boys who raced away across the airship's webwork of spars. At the great window that occupied the whole of the forward wall, watching the clouds part as we plunged into them, stood the captain. I had suspected whose ship this might be upon seeing it. Now I was sure. A giant of a man dressed in buckskin and adorned with feathers, his braided red hair and bristling beard proclaimed him the scion of those who had fled the destruction of Viking ire to settle on the banks of the Father of Waters. This ship, then, was the Hiawatha McCool, and this the man who terrorized commerce from the shores of Lake Erie to the border of Texas. Chippewa Melko, I said. He turned, raising an eyebrow. Found him sightseeing on the starboard spine, one of my captors said. Indeed, said Melko. Did you fall off the shore? I jumped after a fashion, I said. The reason thereof is a tale that strains my own credibility, although I lived it. Sadly, this quip was lost on Melko, as he was distracted by some pressing bit of martial business. We were descending at a precipitous rate. The water of Lake Erie loomed before us, filling the window. Individual whitecaps were discernible upon its surface. When I glanced away from the window, the bridge had darkened. Every wisdom tank was grey and lifeless. You there, spy, Melko barked. I noted with discomfiture that he addressed me. Why would they disrupt our communications? What? I said. The pirate captain gestured at the muddy tanks. The Aryan war city. They've disrupted the Brahmanic field with some damn device. They mean to cripple us, I suppose. Ships like theirs are dependent on it. Won't work. But how do they expect to get their hostages back alive if they refuse to parley? Uh, perhaps they mean to come aboard and take them, I offered. We'll see about that, he said grimly. Listen up, boys. We hauled ass to avoid a trap, but the trap found us anyway. But we can outrun this bastard in the high air streams if we lose all extra weight. Dinky, run and tell Max to drop the steamer. Red, Ali, mark the aft fore and starboard harpoons with boys and let them go. Greg, Ngooby, same with the spent tensors, fast. He turned to me as his minions scurried to their tasks. We're throwing old dead weight over the side. That includes you, unless I'm swiftly convinced otherwise. Who are you? Gabriel Goodman, I said truthfully, but better known by my cool name, Benjamin Rosenbaum. Benjamin Rosenbaum, the pirate cried, the great Iowa poet, author of Green Nakedness and Broken Lines. You're a hero of our land, sir. Fear not, I shall... No, I interrupted crossly. Not that Benjamin Rosenbaum. The pirate reddened and tapped his teeth, frowning. Ah, hold, then I have heard of you. The children's tale scribe, I take it. Legs the caterpillar? I'll spare you then for the sake of my son Timmy, who... No, I said again through gritted teeth. I am an author of plausible fables, sir, not picture books. Never read the stuff, said Melko. There was a great shudder, and the steel bulk of the steam generatory, billowing white clouds, fell past us. It struck the lake, raising a plume of spray that spotted the window with droplets. The forward harpoon assembly followed, trailing a red boil in a line. Right then, said Melko, over you go. You spoke of Aryan hostages, I said hastily, thinking it wise now to mention the position I seem to have accepted de facto, if not yet de jure. Do you by any chance refer to my employer Prem Ramason and his consort? Melko spat on the floor, causing a cabin boy to rush forward with a mop. So you're one of those quizlings who serves Hindu royalty even as they divide up the land of your fathers, are you? He advanced towards me menacingly. Outer Thule is a minor province of the Raj, sir, I said. It is absurd to blame Ramason for the war in Texas. Ready to rise, sir, came the cry. Rise then, Melko ordered. Throw this dog in the brig with its master. If we can't ransom them, we'll throw them off at the top. 
He glowered at me. That'll give you a nice long while to solve your conscience with making fine distinctions among Hindus. What do you think he's doing here in our lands if not plotting with his brothers to steal more of our gold and helium? I was unable to further pursue my political debate with Chipoa Melko, as his henchmen dragged me at once to cramped quarters between the inner and outer hull. The prince lay on the single bunk, ashen and unmoving. His consort knelt at his side, weeping silently. The wisdom servant, deprived of its animating field, had collapsed into a tangle of reed-like protuberances. My valise was there, I opened it and took out my inkwell. The wisdom ants lay within, tiny crumpled blobs of brassy metal. I put the inkwell in my pocket. Thank you for trying, Sarasvati said as Dot here said hoarsely. Alas, luck has turned against us. All may not be lost, I said. An Aryan war city pursues the pirates and may yet buy our ransom. Although strangely, they've damped the Brahmanic field and so cannot hear the pirates' offer of parley. If they were going to parley, they would have done so by now, she said dully. They will burn the pirate from the sky. They do not know we are aboard. Then our bad luck comes in threes. It's an old rule of thumb, derided as superstition by professional causalists. But they, like all professionals, like to obfuscate their science, rendering it inaccessible to the layman. In truth, the old rule holds a glimmer of the workings of the third form of causality. A swift death is no bad luck for me, Sarasvati Siddhastotir said. Not when he is gone. She choked a sob and turned away. I felt for the Raja's pulse. His blood was still beneath his amber skin. His face was turned towards the metal bulkhead. Droplets of moisture there told of his last breath not long ago. I wiped them away and closed his eyes. We waited for one doom or another. I could feel the zeppelin rising swiftly. The Hiawatha was unheated and the air turned cold. The princess did not speak. My mind turned again to the fable I'd been commissioned to write, the materialist shadow history of a world without zeppelins. If by some unlikely chance I should live to finish it, I resolved to make do without the extravagant perils, ironic coincidences, sudden bursts of insight, death-defying escapades and beautiful villainesses that litter our genre and cheapen its high philosophical concerns. Why must every protagonist be doomed, daring, lonely, and overly proud? No, my philosopher hero would enjoy precisely those goods of which I was deprived. A happy family, a secure situation, a prosperous and powerful nation, a conciliatory nature. Above all, an absence of immediate physical peril. Of course, there must be conflict, worry, and sorrow, but... I vowed of a rich and subtle kind. I wondered how my hero would view the chain of events in which I was embroiled. With derision? With compassion? I loved him after a fashion, for he was my creation. How would he regard me? If only the first and simplest form of causality had earned his allegiance, he would not be placated by such easy sores as bad things come in threes. An assassin, and a pirate, and an uncommunicative war city, he would ask, all within the space of an hour? Would he simply accept the absurd and improbable results of living within a blind and random machine? Yet his society could not have advanced far, mired in such fatalism. Would he not doggedly seek meaning, despite the limitations of his framework? What if our bad luck were no coincidence at all, he would ask. What if all three misfortunes had a single, linear, proximate cause, intelligible to reason? My lady, I said, I do not wish to cause you further pain, yet... I find I must speak. I saw the face of the prince's killer. It was a young woman's face, 
in lineament much like your own. Shakuntala, the princess cried, my sister. No, it cannot be. She would never do this. She curled her hands into fists. No! And yet, I said gently, it seems you regard the assertion as not utterly implausible. She is banished, Sarasvati Siddhartha said. She has gone over to the Thanes, the Nordic Liberation Army, the anarcho gynarchist insurgents in our land. It is like her to seek danger and glory, but she would not kill Prem. She loved him before I. To that I could find no response. The Hiawatha shuddered around us. Some battle had been joined. We heard shouts and running footsteps. Sarasvati, the prince, the pirates, any of them would have had a thousand gods to pray to, convenient gods for any occasion. Such solace I could sorely have used, but I was raised a Karaite. We acknowledge only one god, austere and magnificent, the one god of all things, attended by his angels and his consort, the Queen of Heaven. The only way to speak to him, we are taught, is in his holy temple, and it lies in ruins these two thousand years. In times like these, we're told to meditate on the contrast between his imperturbable magnificence and our own abandoned and abject vulnerability, and to be certain that he watches with immeasurable compassion, though he will not act. I have never found this much comfort. Instead, I turned to the prince, curious what in his visage might have inspired the passions of the two sisters. On the bulkhead just before his lips, where before I had wiped away the sign of his last breath, a tracery of condensation stood. Was this some effluvium issued by the organs of a decaying corpse? I bent and delicately sniffed, detecting no corruption. My lady, I said, indicating the droplets on the cool metal. He lives. What? the princess cried. But how? A diguanodinium compound produced by certain marine dinoflagellates, I said, can induce a death-like coma in which the subject breathes but thrice an hour. The heartbeat is similarly undetectable. Delicately, she felt his face. Can he hear us? Perhaps. Why would she do this? The body would be rushed back to Thule, would it not? Perhaps the revolutionaries meant to steal it and revive him as a, a hostage? A tremendous thunderclap shook the Hiawatha Makul, and I noticed we were listening to one side. There was a commotion in the gangway, then Chippewa Melko entered. Several guards stood behind him. Damn tenacious, he spat. If they want you so badly, why won't they parley? We're still out of range of the war city itself and its big guns, thank Buddha, Thor and Darwin. We burned one of their launches at the cost of many of my men, but the other launch is gaining. Perhaps they don't know the hostages are aboard, I asked. Then why pursue me this distance? I'm no fool. I know what it costs them to detour that monster. They don't do it for sport, and I don't flatter myself I'm worth that much to them. No, it's you they want. So they can have you. I've no more stomach for this chase. He gestured at the prince with his chin. Is he dead? No, I said. Huh, doesn't look well. No matter, come along. I'm putting you all in a launch with a flag of parley on it. Their war boat will have to stop for you, and that will give us the time we need. So it was that we found ourselves in the freezing, cramped bay of a pirate longboat. Three of Melko's crewmen accompanied us, one at the controls, the other two clinging to the longboat's sides. Sarasvati and I huddled on the aluminium deck beside the pilot, the prince's body held between us. All three of Melko's men had parachutes. They planned to escape as soon as we docked. Our longboat flew the white flag of Pyrely, and, taken from the prince's luggage, the royal standard of outermost Thule. All the others were gazing tensely at our target, the war city's fighter launch, which climbed toward us from below. It was almost as big as Melko's flagship. 
I alone glanced back out the open doorway as we swung away from the Hiawatha. So only I saw a brightly coloured glider detach itself from the Hiawatha's side and swoop to follow us. Why would Shakuntala have lingered with the pirates? Once the rebels' plan to abduct the prince was foiled by Melko's arrival, why not simply abandon it and await a fairer chance? Unless the intent was not to abduct, but to protect. My lady, I said in my halting middle school Sanskrit, your sister is here. Sarasvati gasped, following my gaze. Madam, your husband was aiding the rebels. How dare you? She hissed in the same tongue, much more fluently. It is the only... Uh, I struggled for the Sanskrit word for hypothesis, then abandoned the attempt, leaning over to whisper in English, Why else did the pirates and the war said he arrived together? Consider... The prince's collusion with the thanes was discovered by the Aryan Raj, but to try him for treason would provoke great scandal and stir sympathy for the insurgents. Instead, they made sure rumour of a valuable hostage reached Melko. With the prince in the hands of the pirates, his death would simply be a regrettable calamity. Her eyes widened. Those monsters, she hissed. Your sister aimed to save him, but Melko arrived too soon, before news of the prince's death could discourage his brigandy. My lady, I fear that if we reach that launch, they will discover that the prince lives, then some accident will befall us all. There were shouts from outside. Melko's crewmen drew their needle throwers and fired at the advancing glider. With a shriek, Sarasvati flung herself at the pilot, knocking the controls from his hands. The longboat lurched sickeningly. I gained my feet, then fell against the prince. I saw a flash of orange and gold, the glider swooping by us. I struggled to stand. The pilot drew his cutlass. He seized Sarasvati by the hair and spun her away from the controls. Just then, one of the men clinging to the outside, pricked by Shakuntala's needle, fell. His tether caught him and the floor jerked beneath us. The pilot staggered back. Sarasvati Siddhartha punched him in the throat. They stumbled towards the door. I started forward. The other pirate on the outside fell, untethered, and the longboat lurched again. Unbalanced, our craft drove in a tight circle, listing dangerously. Sarasvati fought with uncommon ferocity, forcing the pirate toward the open hatch. Fearing they would both tumble through, I seized the controls. Regrettably, I knew nothing of flying airship longboats whose controls, as it happens, are of a remarkably poor design. One would imagine that the principal steering element could be moved in the direction that one wishes the craft to go. Instead, just the opposite is the case. Then, too, one would expect those brawny and unrefined airmen to use controls lending themselves to rough usage. Instead, it seems an exceedingly fine hand is required. Thus, rather than studying the craft, I achieved the opposite. Not only was Sarasvati and the pilot flung out the cabin door, but I myself was thrown through it, just managing to catch with both hands a metal protuberance in the hatchway's base, my feet swung freely over the void. I looked up in time to see the Raja's limp body come sliding towards me like a missile. I fear that I hesitated too long in deciding whether to dodge or catch my almost employer. At the last minute, courage won out and I flung one arm around his chest as he struck me. This dislodged my grip and the two of us fell from the airship. In an extremity of terror, I let go the prince and clawed wildly at nothing. I slammed into the body of the pirate who hung, poisoned by Shakuntala's needle, from the airship's tether. I slid along him and finally caught myself at his feet. As I clung there, shaking miserably, I watched Prem Ramason tumble through the air, 
and I cursed myself for having caused the very tragedies I'd endeavoured to avoid, like a figure in an Athenian tragedy. But such tragedies proceed from some essential flaw in their heroes, some illustrative hubris, some damning vice. Searching my own character and actions, I could find only that I'd endeavoured to make do as well as I could in situations for which I was ill-prepared. <laughs> Is that not the fate of any of us, confronting life and its vagaries? Was my tale then an absurd and tragic farce? Was its lesson one merely of ignominy and despair? Or perhaps, as my shadow protagonist might imagine, there was no tale, no teller. Perhaps the dramatic and sensational events I'd endured were part of no story at all but brute and silent facts of matter. From above, Shakuntala sit his dot here, dove in her glider. It was folded like a spear, and she swept past the prince in seconds. Nimbly, she flung open the glider's wings, sweeping up to the falling Raja, and rolling the glider, took him into her embrace. Thus encumbered, she must have secured him somehow, she dove again, chasing her sister, I imagine, and disappeared in a bank of cloud. A flock of brass-coloured wisdom gulls, arriving from the Aryan war city, flew around the pirate's launch. They entered its empty cabin, glanced at me and the poisoned pirate to whom I clung, and departed. I climbed up the body to sit upon its shoulders, a much more comfortable position. There, clinging to the tether and shivering, I rested. The Hiawatha Makul, black smoke guttering from one side of her, climbed higher and higher into the sky, pursued by the Aryan war boat. The sun was setting, limning the clouds with gold and pink and violet. The war city, terrible and glorious, sailed slowly by under my feet, its shadow an island of darkness in the sunset's gold glitter on the waters of the lake beneath. Some distance to the east, where the sky was already darkening to a rich cobalt, the Aryan war boat which Melko had successfully struck was bathed in white fire. After a while, the inner hull must have been breached, for the fire went out, extinguished by escaping helium and the zeppelin plummeted. Above me the propeller hummed, driving my launch in the same small circle again and again. I hoped that I'd saved the prince after all. I hoped Shakuntala had saved her sister, and that the three of them would find refuge with the thanes. My shadow protagonist had given me a gift. It was the logic of his world that led me to discover the war city's threat. Did this mean his philosophy was the correct one? Yet the events that followed were so dramatic and contrived, precisely as if I inhabited a pulp romance. Perhaps he was writing my story as I wrote his. Perhaps, with the comfortable life I had given him, he longed to lose himself in uncomfortable escapades of this sort. In that case... We both of us lived in a world designed, a world of story, full of meaning. But perhaps I'd framed the question wrong. Perhaps the division between mind and matter is itself illusory. Perhaps randomness, pattern and plan are all but stories we tell about the incohate and unknowable world which fills the darkness beyond the thin circle illumined by reason's light. Perhaps it's foolish to ask if I, or the protagonist of my World Without Zeppelin story, is the more real. Each of us is flesh, a buzzing swarm of atoms, yet each of us also a tale contained in the pages of the other's notebook. We are bodies, but we are also the stories we tell about each other. Perhaps not knowing is enough. Maybe it's not a matter of discovering the correct philosophy, Maybe the desire that burns behind this question is the desire to be real. And which is more real? A clod of dirt unnoticed at your feet, or a hero in a legend? And maybe 
behind the desire to be real is simply wanting to be known, to be held. The first stars glittered against the fading blue. I was in the bosom of the Queen of Heaven. My fingers and toes were getting numb. Soon frostbite would set in. I recited the prayer the ancient heretical rabbis would say before death, which begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Then I began to climb the tether. And welcome back. That was Biographical Notes to A Discourse on the Nature of Causality with Airplanes by Benjamin Rosenbaum. By Benjamin Rosenbaum. And if you enjoyed that, you may wish to dive even further back into the archives to episode 5 for The Ant King, A California Fairy Tale. He also appeared on a skatepod three times back in the day, in episodes 24, 99 and 106. And now, through the magic of audio production, we will seamlessly transition into an interview with Anne Leckie, former editor of this flying castle from her earliest days, to discuss why she chose this story and what the castle was like when it was just a Mott and Bailey in the clouds. Hi Anne, thank you for coming on to Podcastle again. First time in a long time, I think. Thank um, you for having me, it's been ages. Yes, I, when, I mean, you finished editing, what, 2009, 10? That sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah, because I think it was, uh, it was Dave and... Right no, oh my god, there's so many editors. <laughs> yeah. Uh yes, I think it's about then. So it has been, you know, well over a decade. So thank you for coming back on. Um so I mean first and foremost, uh would you like to introduce yourself for those listeners who might not have been around for your editorial run? So uh I'm Anne Leckie. Uh I am of course famous for being the first assistant editor of Podcastle. <laughs> That's not what I'm famous for. Um <laughs> I'm actually famous for having written Ancillary Justice, but it is true. Uh, Rachel Swirsky was the first, she was the founding editor of Podcastle, uh, and I worked as her assistant editor of Reading Slush, basically. Um, And so that's who I am. In fact, uh, at one point, this was several years ago, it was after Ancillary Justice had come out, and I was at a bead store, actually. Uh, And the nephew of the person who owned the bead store turned out, I didn't realize it was a podcast listener. And uh, at one point he was like, oh, there's somebody named Anne Leckie on Podcastle. And I said, do you not recognize me? And he said, what? And I said, welcome to Podcastle. I'm Anne Leckie. And he went, ah, (laughs) like literally started screaming. And uh, yeah, for a long time, that's what people knew me for. Like nobody knew that I wrote stories. They knew that I was a host on Podcastle. I've not had that moment yet. I look forward to it one day. It'll happen. <laughs> It'll happen. I'm, I don't blame you for not recognising you, given that we're an audio market, to be fair. True. Yes, but I talk <laughs> all the time. We would have conversations and stuff. Oh, right. A lot of people would recognise my voice, which is yes. one of the fun things. Yeah. So, why did you choose the story you chose today, apart from the fact that it's an absolutely brilliant piece of mad genius? It's a brilliant piece of mad genius. <laughs> Isn't um, it? I, I love the title. First of yes. all, the title is amazing. Notes to a Discourse on the Nature of Reality with Airplanes by Benjamin Rosenbaum. By Benjamin by ben. Rosenbaum. <laughs> exactly. Um, I loved the sort of alternate reality. I loved the the sort of... It's just funny and charming. And it's such a neat alternate world that he's made, even though it's clearly there to be charming and funny and kind of a little thought experiment. Um, and... Uh, And interestingly, this is kind of funny, I know when we were emailing back and forth and I was asked to provide a couple of stories just in case Rachel's and mine overlapped. And I was like, oh, that's not going to (laughs) happen. And and y'all were pretty, thought that was pretty funny. And apparently Rachel said exactly the same thing when she was asked that. Um, But our, we uh, are good friends, Rachel and I, and uh, Rachel is, of course, an amazing writer. Mm. our tastes don't always line up. 
I mean, sometimes they do, but there are ways in which our aesthetics are very different. So uh, after a couple of years uh, as an, uh, the assistant editor, uh, Rachel said, let's have a week where you pick the st- or a week, a month where you pick all the stories. And so I was like, can I even pick ones that you rejected? Rachel hadn't wanted that story. I was like, I love this story. And Rachel was like, it's really good, but I don't want to run it. Um, and I was like, okay, it's my month. I'm going <laughs> to run this story. Uh, and it's not a question of whether the story was good enough, because obviously it's a fabulous story. Um, but I think it's a really good demonstration of how um, an editor's individual taste actually plays a really strong role. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, where there'll be an incredible story and you'll be like, this is a really good story. And I don't like it very much. Right. Or it yeah. just doesn't grab my heart really hard. Um, but wow, that's a really great story. And part of being an editor is actually using your personal taste to sort of guide what you're choosing, um, which in some ways can make a, a writer trying to sell stories sort of despair. Like, how can I possibly meet an editor's personal taste? But also when one editor says, well, no, that doesn't mean that another editor isn't going to go, oh, this is a story I've been waiting for for so long. Um, but no, I love this story. I just love how funny it is. I love how positive. I'm going to say positive. That's the wrong word. Um, it's, Manic it, energy, I think, isn't it? It just gives it that sort of happy feeling. It does. It's very, it's very compassionate toward, mm. you know, its antagonist. Uh, it's just, and, and I love the mechanics of the ending, which is very much everything's just falling apart. What, what can I do? You know, I climb, you know? I, I go up, you know, uh, I really, it, it's a really, it's a lovely ending. And I just, I really, I love the world building. I just, I think it's a neat, yeah. it's a neat, neat story. It's, you can really tell just how clever Ben is from reading this. So just the throwaway lines in it, like I could never conceive of some of these things. He just dashes off at the back half of a sentence. Oh, Ben's fabulous. And yeah. I know uh, at, when back when I had time in my schedule and there wasn't a plague and I would go to Wiscon, uh, he would do a, a like let's build a world panel and he was mm. just hilarious. He's just he's so funny, so sharp. Um, yeah, he's just amazing. Um, and I know he has a novel out recently, I mm-hmm. think, and I really need to pick it up uh, because I just love his work so much. Yeah. So you've sort of spoken a bit there about how you and Rachel had differing tastes because yes, you and Rachel both did say there's no chance of us overlapping, which I did find quite funny. Um, Did you sort of learn to play that into a strength then between the two of you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And also, I mean, we each trusted each other's judgment enough that even if my aesthetic wasn't the same as hers, uh, if I saw something come in that was really high quality, that was her aesthetic and not mine, I knew she'd want to see that. Um, Or something that was very much my aesthetic and really well done, but she probably wouldn't take, I could send up and say, I really like this. Please. (laughs) Would you please? You know, and sometimes the answer would be yes, and sometimes the answer would be no, you know. Yeah. That's life. The slush pile is made of hard choices. I mean, we open, we're open, we open at the moment, and we will probably get around a 1,000 submissions, and we need to choose, like, 15 or 20, you know. It's... Right, exactly. And so many of those submissions will be so good. Yeah, there is nothing um, you can pick out as a flaw or a reason why not, just for whatever reason, that day, that time, it just didn't quite land right for you personally, and you can't. I spent a long time when I started switching, really second guessing myself, like, well, who am I to decide this? Well, I'm the person who's been trusted by the higher ups to make these decisions. And at the end of the day, you've only got your own taste. That's exactly right. And uh, in fact, uh, I've told this story a few times, but I don't know if you've heard it. When I first started slush reading uh, for Podcastle, I was uh, I was trying to sell stories. Right. Uh, I was very much a sort of a beginning uh, writer sending out my own stories on submission. And I had heard, like a lot of us here, that you have to grab your the reader like in the first sentences that that nobody will read to the end of your story if they're not. And I was like, that's not fair. That is not fair. And I am here for all the submitting writers and I'm going to read every submission all the way to the end. That lasted for about a year, which is longer than it probably should have. Um, But one of the things I discovered is that with the volume of stuff coming in, first of all, 
you have to cut very quickly. You have to say, I'm not going to keep going with this. Um, and also nine times out of 10, you can tell in the first page or so if it's something you're going to take um, for whatever reason. There are many, many reasons why you might say, I'm not going to finish reading this by the end of the page. Um, and so that's a thing where, like you say, you can only take a certain number of them. You have to cut somehow. You can't spend forever thinking about what you're going to take because you got to fill up that month's schedule, right? Uh, and so at a certain point, you just have to kind of go by instinct. And that's, I mean, editors are doing that. And that's how that is. But the good news is maybe some editor is going to make a different, a different call. You never know when you're going to find the editor who just for whatever reason completely vibes with your work and you're made. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you were, as you've mentioned, founding assistant editor along with Rachel, uh, who will give us, uh, has given us the story of how everything got started. Can you tell us a bit about what it was like in those early days, sort of getting the castle off the ground and flying through the air for the first time? It was super interesting. Um, it was the first time that I had seen from the back. I mean, I knew in theory what happened uh, with a publication or with a podcast. Uh, and I didn't, I hadn't ever actually like gotten my hands in the actual mechanism. And it was really kind of fun and interesting. At first it was like, woohoo, I'm working in a, at a podcast. I'm, re well, rejecting stuff isn't as fun as accepting stuff. It was much, much funner to pass stuff up to Rachel. Mm. Like, look at this cool, cool thing that I found. And oh, I'm going to have to send a rejection for these. Um, and uh, I spent some time thinking about what my rejection note was going to, I was like, that was really fraught. Right. Finally, once I wrote it, then it was done and I could just send it out. But at first I was like, oh, and I've been in these people's shoes. This is hard. Yeah, I, I really want to say I feel for you. Please keep writing. But I know I can't, you know, just individually go and and, you know, give someone some chocolates and pat them <laughs> on the head and say it's OK. You know, yeah. just keep going. Um, so so that was kind of fun. But it, it's really interesting to be on the other side. Um, and of course, it took a little while. At first, we had stories. I think the first thing we ran was Peter Beagle. Yes. That yeah. was the first. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't have Slush open. We had chosen a few stories uh, and then open Slush. And so it took a little bit for that to kind of get running. And it was it was really interesting. The more and more stories came in, uh, the larger volume, the more interesting it was. Uh, it was really a lot of fun. Yeah. What was your sort of volume of stories like back in the day? I'm sorry? How many sort of stories did you get in at a time back in the day? Oh, offhand, I don't know, because I would just go into the email box every day. We didn't use, I think you all are using... We're on uh, Moksha now. You're on Moksha now. Mm. Uh, we weren't. It, they would just come into a Gmail box. Yeah. Uh, and I had keys to the Gmail inbox, and I would just tag things, right? Okay. And I would reject the things that I didn't think Rachel needed to see. Uh, and then I would tag uh, for her to see the things I thought and then give a note if there needed to be a note. Uh, and so it was very, and and sometimes stuff would come in and the inbox would just be crammed with stuff and I would just go down, 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 down. Um, so it was very different. I bet it's easier with Moksha because you can probably filter stuff more easily. Um, it was actually uh, reading slash for Podcastle when I won, mm. uh, who was it? Oh, shoot. I know him. He, he runs the submission grinder. Oh, David Steffen. David Steffen. This is terrible. Very nice young man. <laughs> hmm. uh, and he had a, he, he may still, had a fair amount of uh, very short pieces that had been published. Uh, and so he had a habit of submitting a short piece immediately after he had been rejected. Right. Which I suspect with Moksha, you can set a... Like, like a, a limit, yeah. yeah. We don't um, actually, but you can do. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, mostly it's not a it's not a thing, mostly. Right. No. Uh, but there was one particular. So Ferret Steinmetz had been rejected mm -hmm. very quickly by me. I had rejected him in like 20 minutes. <laughs> um, and uh, he he said to make himself feel better, he was going to offer a pizza to anybody who was rejected faster than 20 minutes. And it was story. not long afterwards when uh, I, I had spent like half the day going through the box because it had really piled up and I was going through and going through and going through and going through and going through. And I rejected something by David Steffen and got all the way through. And I was like, Whoa, look at that empty inbox and bing. And he comes in <laughs> from David Steffen. Yep. <laughs> all right, David, 
<laughs> and so I opened it up and it was very short. Otherwise I couldn't have done this. It was very short. And I was like, Rachel is not going to want this. And I rejected it less than five minutes after he had submitted. Oh. And so he went, Ferret bought him some pizza. Fair he enough. Had, and then we ran into each other at Worldcon. And I'm like, I really did not mean to do that to you in quite that. You don't want it to come across <laughs> as brutal. But I mean, the fact is, it takes five or ten minutes a lot of the time to sort of read and make the decision anyway. And if it feels yeah. like it took a week, that's only because it sat there for a week not being looked at. So it's, right. Yeah. yeah. And why make people wait? I know one of the exactly. nice things about doing online submissions is back in the day, mm. I remember when I walked uphill to school both ways in the snow. <laughs> uh, we Self-addressed used to... stamped envelope. Yes. And you would wait for weeks. Yeah. Weeks. I, uh, I got in just at the death of postal submissions, just as online was becoming the norm. And I'm great, especially over in the UK when most of the magazines are in the US. I cannot imagine. Overseas oh, submission. Holy cow. And now, like, something doesn't come back within a few days and people are like, what is up with this? What is up with this? And yeah. I'm like, oh, you children. And ironically enough, you're probably on David's submissions grinder looking at the graph to work out if you'll pass the first round of rejections. Have you seen his submissions grinder? <laughs> But, uh, that's a wonderful I have, site. I stopped, he set that up, I think, after I had sold Ancillary mm. Justice. Um, and, of course, my submission process is very different now. Yeah. Um, but I remember back in the day, it wasn't Submission Grinder. It was, there was another site. Uh, this is yes. terrible. What was it? They started charging, which is why David started Submissions Grinder. Exactly. I can't remember uh, the name of it now, but Submissions Grinder was wonderful. And David's always, well, he just won a Fire Award from, um, sorry, an Ignite Award from Fire for community service for the Submissions Grinder. It's a wonderful platform. Resource. Although those graphs and stuff, the other site had that too, where you could hmm. see how long, how many other people on the site had submissions in, how long they'd been in, how long yep. it average was before they, and you could really obsess over that really nicely. Yeah, like, it's really oh, reading the tea leaves. Dance. Yeah. Um, and, but it's a it's a good resource because then you can say, oh, well, I shouldn't have heard back within a month. It's normal. There's yes, 73 yes. other people ahead of me in the queue. And it's analog. It's going to be another nine months. It's fine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you think working out podcasts will change you and your writing? Because I just read Raven Tower and it did strike me as fitting. The entire novel is narrated to the protagonist. Indeed, it is. Although I wasn't thinking of it in, in podcast terms, but no, you're right. But that's I wonder if it's sort of a subconscious, you know, the voice has sunk in. It might well be. It might well be. I found that just, uh, first of all, it was super fun to narrate episodes and to host episodes. That was just, that was cool. Um, and reading Slush generally really gave me a feel for what might or might not be working in a piece and what might or might not need to be done to make it work better for me. Um, I do think that year of reading entire manuscripts, uh, while it was exhausting, uh, it really did show me a lot of things about how structures of pieces were and weren't working or where people would go wrong. Uh, and, uh, and I find that's extremely important. Uh, and I do think a lot of times people say, oh, uh, baby writers ought to read slush. And I agree. Uh, I think it's a really good it's a really good experience. Although I do think uh, it's important to let them have a little authority and a little bit of sort of editorial input. So that, because that was the cool thing about my being friends with Rachel, which was that we would just sit down and talk about what choices would be made and why and what we thought about the things. Um, I know some places don't let their slushers actually send rejections. They tag things to reject and then someone else goes through and, which I understand when you don't really, you don't have implicit trust that somebody's gonna not make a goofy mistake. Um, and, or when someone's new. Uh, but I do think having a little bit of authority as practice for making those calls is probably good. Yeah, I mean, as slushers, we make the call on our rejection. And when we bump something in Moksha, conveniently, we can follow it so that then we see the follow up comments made by the bosses. So you oh, can good. see the reasons why they then accept or reject. Um, that is it good. is nice like to be involved. I mean, we've got a very good sort of, I mean, the team's really good at talking to each other and getting second opinions and everything. So it is a nice little family. It's lovely. Yeah. Was it just you and Rachel back in the day then? It was just me and Rachel. Oh my it goodness, was that must have been exhausting. I mean, there's about a dozen of us now. 
and that feels oh my goodness, really? low on numbers at the minute. It's we've lost well, a few. We probably recently. get more subs now than than we used well, to. We were not a civil qualifying market, and no. you are now. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that that probably makes a difference in the volume of subs, but we still got quite a lot. Not only SIF were, not, uh, SIF were pro rate, but Hugo nominated and British Fantasy Award winning, yes. of course. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. yeah. And, uh, we've got we were nominated for a Stabby. We've been nominated for the Ignite Awards. We've been nominated for oh god, all over the place. We're doing pretty well for ourselves recently. Actually, it's tw- yeah. two years in a row. Actually, we had the Hugo nod. Um, fingers crossed for this year, which is almost the second felt more meaningful. Like the first time, you feel like, or maybe that was just you know the limit of our fingertips. We were just reaching for it. So to get it the second time, like no, we've got a firmer grasp on this recognition. That really meant a lot, the second one. So yeah. Yeah, we, we have ended up in high and mighty places thanks to the running start you gave us, which is... is well, nice. but I mean, y'all have done incredible work yourselves. I mean, we could have handed stuff over and folks could have not done so well with it, right? I think there were times it was perhaps when you talked to sort of Alistair about, you know, when he took over the company, it was on rocky ground. It nearly crashed into the cliffside. Um, but, it's, you know, here well, we I mean, are that's now. Hard. That's hard. I mean, when you're not used to doing all that and yeah. Hmm. It's difficult, but he's, I mean, the whole thing is done really well. It's oh, yeah, fair. it's it's on for now that we've got the non-profit status as well from the last couple of months. We are on firmer footing than ever. It's, you know, there's untold heights ahead of us, I hope. Yeah. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, you had great success, speaking of success, with your debut science fiction trilogy with Ancillary Justice, as mentioned, winning the Hugo, the Nebula, the BSFA, the Arthur C. Clarke and the Locus Awards, all while you were still editing this with Rachel. Then most recently, you've done the Raven Tower, which is a fantasy novel of gods and powers. So, do you think you'll keep keep skipping between genres going forward? And what is it that particularly draws you to one or the other for any given story idea? So, I'm actually I could start a big fight here. I actually don't <laughs> see a huge difference between science fiction and fantasy. Me either. Uh, there's people who would be out with torches and pitchforks over that. And I mean, your opinion is valid. You get to have an opinion, even if it's wrong. (laughs) Um, But uh, I mean, I do feel there are different modes of each and there are modes of spec fic that are more fantasy-ish. And there are modes of spec fic that are much more science-y. Very little science fiction is actually scientific. I I was raised by scientists and they would laugh at my taste in literature like this isn't science but (laughs) uh but i do i feel like i tend to approach fantasy a little more science fictionally than in other cases Hmm. than than maybe some other folks do um i mean raven tower had quite strict rules in place for the god's powers oh yeah and they're part of the tension and you know the the explanation behind what's happening they were very physics based too Hmm. like the it if uh for folks who haven't read it gods have to speak the truth and uh if a god says something that isn't true they have to use their power to make it true but some things aren't ever going to be true no matter what and some things take more energy to make true than other things right um so there was very much a sort of conservation of matter and energy going on with a lot of the stuff there right uh which you know, you don't have to pay attention to that in fantasy if you don't want to, but I kind of wanted to. I thought it was kind of cool. But since it was fantasy, I didn't have to pay complete attention to it, right, yeah. if I didn't want to. Um, but, yeah, I do. I like that sort of stricter framework. Um, and, in fact, uh, actually, some of my stories ran on Podcastle. Uh, Rachel bought them. Uh, and... Uh, and a lot of people thought of me as a fantasy writer, the folks who knew my my short fiction and were surprised when I came out with a science fiction novel. And a lot of the people who read my science fiction novels were surprised when I came out with fantasy and were like, oh, you've newly turned to fantasy. And I'm like, well, no, not actually. I've got this, mm. you know, half a dozen fantasy stories. Um, so I can go either way, depending, you know, depending mm. on whatever, whatever I strikes you. Yeah. Yeah, but I definitely want to keep going back and forth. Uh, although at this point, I think my science fiction sells better. But I mean, yeah, it's true because 
you think there's a lot of crossover. I mean, I agree with you. I don't really see a difference. I read them equally. I watch them equally. I write them equally. I probably lean slightly towards fantasy because that was just what I happened to read more of as a kid. And like you, I just sometimes when you write in the science fiction, I get a bit bogged down in the detail. I'm like, oh, I can't bother with this. It's just wave a hand and go, oh, it's magic. Yeah, yeah. sometimes it's easier. Um, but yeah, this idea that you sell better in science fiction, but not in fantasy, as if they're these disparate, separate genres is kind of strange. And are, I mean, and historically, most people who have written one, or a lot of people who have written one, have also written the other. Yeah. Uh, and they're very difficult to separate, possibly yeah. because historically the authors have been so intermixed. Um, trying to define, I mean, if you really want, you can either have a good discussion or a knockdown, drag out brawl. <laughs> Uh, trying to define the boundary between mm. the two. Uh, it's really very difficult to do. Yeah. Um, and That's I think with that, any boundary, I think. Oh, well, yeah. Boundaries are boundaries are fake anyway. Uh, but this one in particular is very vexed and difficult to draw. Mm. I mean, this isn't even just like, you know, when does the when do a few grains of sand become a heap? This is mm. like they're so mixed up together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the And authors have played with mixing them up deliberately for so long. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I feel like you, but people talk about them like they're so different and it's really very strange to me. Uh, or, you know, yeah. well, obviously science fiction is more rational and better than fantasy. And I'm like, what? what, what, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure uh, June is necessarily more coherent and sciencey than Lord of the Rings even necessarily. I mean, right? June is basically magic. Dune, well, Dune is a fantasy. Yeah. Dune is, in, in fact, my personal definition of when do you know something's a space opera and not hard science fiction is if the culture fights with swords, if a technologically <laughs> advanced culture fights with swords, you got yourself a space yeah. opera on your hands. That is the next thing to a fantasy. The most important thing in the science fiction is working out what's your excuse for why people still use swords just because they look cool. Exactly. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, if, if you've got your technologically advanced society using swords, it's because you think swords are cool. Yep. I mean, swords are cool. What reason, I don't care what slow shield or whatever it is you come <laughs> up with. I, I'm sorry. It's aesthetic. Yeah, it's because you think swords are cool. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. Swords nope. are cool. I'm never sure. going to begrudge that to anybody. <laughs> yeah, but, but Dune is very definitely not a great example of Diamond Heart SF. No. Goodness, yeah. no. <laughs> so what are you working on now that we can look forward to so uh i actually have a book coming out in june it comes out june 6th called translation state and it's set in the uh ancillary justice universe in the imperial raj uh and one at least of the characters is a uh, a Presker translator the uh the humans who were sort of created by the mysterious powerful dangerous mm -hmm. alien Presker to mediate between themselves and humans um, a lot of people really liked the Presker translators in the trilogy mm -hmm. and were unhappy that they weren't on stage for as long as they wanted them to be. So uh, they should be satisfied with with translation state. So Giving the people what they want. Yes. Can't go wrong. Well, also, it was fun. I, I wrote it because I wanted to. But I mean, that's I the like, best reason. Yeah. You can tell when someone's not enthusiastic about what they're writing. You've got to. Oh, yes. And I'm really lucky at this point. I've been very fortunate. I can mostly write what I want to write. Hmm. Do you think you'll go back to the Raven Tower world? Oh, almost certainly. Good. I yeah. look forward to it. Um, finally then, what works would you recommend people read if they're interested in your stuff and where can people find out more about you? So uh, I do have a website, uh, annlecky.com. Um, people who are interested in my work and haven't read any should probably start with either Ancillary Justice or the Raven Tower. Um, there is on my website, you can find my short fiction, uh, much of which is available free online. It's linked on my website. Um, and, uh, and you can hear some of my stories on PodCastle, although you got to dig pretty far back into the archives. But that's what this year is all about is digging back into those archives because there's yeah. so much of them. Oh my goodness. Yes. And there's so much fabulous stuff mm. in there. Just so much. So I think we're coming up with episode 800 is sometime later this year. Holy cow! <laughs> that was a good face. It's a kind of shame that no one else is going to get to see this video but well, me. Well, that's one of those things like, you know, when you see, you know, somebody had a baby and you see the baby and you're like, oh, they're so cute. And then sometime later, you they're see a teenager. them and they're like, they're like in college. They've yep. got a professional job. They've got their own kids. And you're like, no way. Yeah. Yeah. 
800 episodes, 15 years, and all started with you and Rachel. So thank you very much for getting us going. It has been a delight. Thank you ever so much for coming on and talking to us again. And thank you for all your work on Podcastle back in the day that got us to where we are now. Well, thank you. Y'all have done such a great job. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at Podcastle, your co-editors Shingai and Jerry Kagunda and Eleanor Arwood, assistant editor Sophie Barker, audio engineers Devin Martin and Eric Valdez, forum moderator Ossicat, and our many wonderful first readers, Aidan Doyle, Andrew Cahoe, Craig Jackson, Amalia Harrington, Julia Pat, Caitlin Zavanovich, Kieran Colsini, Ryan Cole, Sarah S. Messenger, Shrikripa Krishna Prasad, Tava Nova, Tierney Bailey, Zeev Wheaties, and myself, Matt Dovey. Thank you for letting us share another story with you. The Legal Bit. Podcastle is part of the Escape Artist Foundation, a 501c3 non-profit, and this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives 4.0 International License. That means you can share it, and please do, but you cannot sell it and you cannot change it. If you want specifics, check creativecommons.org. Our music is by Shiva in Exile. Everything we do on Podcastle is 100% donor funded, and if you'd like to support what we and the rest of EA do, please join us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash EA podcast. Prefer another method? There's details for supporting us via Twitch, Amazon Prime, Ko-fi and PayPal on escapeartist.net. We'll be back next Tuesday with another fantastic tale. In the meantime, you might care to check our sister podcasts, Escape Pod for Science Fiction, Pseudopod for Horror, Cast of Wonders for YA Speculative Fiction, and Cat's Cast for Cat Fiction. If your heart belongs to us, though, we'll see you next week. Be safe and be kind. <laughs>